Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for discussing today with us RFID security. I'm Carsten, outgoing PhD student at the University of Virginia, and this is Henrik, an incoming PhD at the Humboldt University here in Berlin. Um, both our research is on RFID security and partly privacy, both of which we want to discuss today with you. Um, RFID, as I'm sure almost everybody is aware of, are these tiny computer chips that have all but one purpose to identify or authenticate themselves. So they are um, an, a virtual name tag for people and things. They are very cheap since they don't require battery um, or any fancy electronics around them. It's just a tiny piece of silicon with an antenna printed or metal around it. Um, RFID security has been very widely discussed, and I'm sure everybody has, has followed some of that discussion. Um, we want to move the focus a little bit away from just security to security and privacy, because we, we think that there's a much wider field of discussion that should be had, and that is the privacy impact of this new technology on everybody's lives. So RFIDs are being used as an, as an identifier um, for things, but also more and more for people through their passports, through their train tickets, through different forms of payment tokens. And those identifiers are machine-readable. So each of us becomes a machine-readable object in some virtual world. And um, unless, um, unless cryptography, for instance, is used to prevent our text from being read by illegitimate readers. We are all beacons, um, but not like the Open Beacon Project, beacons where we voluntarily subscribe, but beacons that can be read out all the time. And <clears throat> so we find that um, the discussion hasn't quite um, moved beyond security yet, and we hope to, to kick this off with, uh, with our work and with this talk. And, um, but we're where this discussion comes back to security is um, at the availability of good cryptography. Both for security and for privacy, you need cryptography as the, the underlying toolbox to, to um, protect data and private data in particular. And we find that um, currently available RFID tokens do not, or the vast majority of them, does not have sufficient cryptography. Um, case in point is the the MIFA Classic RFID tag, which uses um, a proprietary um, cryptography. Which the, the, a manufacturer came up with that cryptography and kept it secret for many years. And now, um, at, almost exactly a year ago, it, um, it, it leaked or started to leak. And um, the subsequent analysis of it has shown that this is very weak. So just very briefly how this, this works, this is a stream cipher. So there's, there's a secret state and, and both the reader and the card that want to communicate now um, know a secret key. So both of them have this, this mechanism and they load the, the secret key into the secret state. And now so that um, replay attacks are prevented. We'll get to that in, in a few minutes. So that replay attacks are prevented. Random numbers have to be exchanged. That's a normal step in every cryptographic protocol. So a challenge and response uh, random number is exchanged, one from the, the generated by the reader and one by the tech. And both of those are also seeded into the secret state. And, and the end of this authentication step, both sides should be convinced that, um, that the other side knows the secret key and that they can now privately communicate with the other side. Now, this talk is mostly going to be about attacks generally on RFIDs and how they apply to, to MIFA Classic and how the assumptions that are underlying this, um, this mechanism are broken. In particular, that this state is secret. We show ways to, to reveal the state that should be secret. <clears throat> so we'll talk um, about various attacks, both the general form and, and how it applies to, to MIFA Classic. We'll then briefly touch on on possible mitigation steps um, that have been proposed. And we'll only discuss two in depth that, that we see some, um, some chance of, of um, success in. And we'll finally release a couple of tools to help you get started in, in RFID security research. Um, 
to, to help you understand what we can attack, let me very briefly describe how exactly this authentication um, is happening between the card and the reader. So you, you see where we are interfering. The card starts off by sending its identifier and a random number to the reader. Nothing else. So, so far, it hasn't given out much private data. You could call this identifier private, but in most cases, it's not considered to be. The, the reader then needs to prove to the card that it knows the secret key. So it takes this random number that was generated by the card and encrypts it under the secret key, sends it back. Now, the card is convinced that the reader knows the secret key. The reader, in turn, has to be convinced that the card knows the secret key. It, too, sends a random number, and uh, the tech will then encrypt the combination of these two random numbers and sends it back. Now, both sides are convinced that they can, they, they can securely communicate. Now, what about this can we break? Well, pretty much everything. We can... <laughs> if, if certain security precautions haven't... Um, been taken in, in the design, we can break pretty much everything. We can emulate, that is, pretend to be somebody else, use somebody else's identification. We can perhaps predict random numbers or alter them in ways so that they become predictable and not random as they're supposed to be. We can attack the encryption itself and maybe reveal the secret key that's underlying that, that is supposed to be secret. And we can finally um, attack the the radio waves and the radio channel and break the assumption that, that if there are two, two devices talking to each other, they must be physically close. Henrik, do you want to get into describing the first attack? Yeah. The first and simplest attack or most simple attack is a relay attack or a proxy attack, depending on who you ask. Um, it consists <coughs> simply of a device that uh, emulates a reader and talks to the real card and a device that emulates a card and talks to the real reader. Between these two, there must be some communication channel. It must, uh, must not be radio. It doesn't have to be radio. It can be uh, wired or it can be radio. It can be pretty much anything. You can run this over GSM or whatever you want. So you have basically unlimited uh, range which breaks the assumption that this card is in close proximity to the reader when it's used. So, for example, if you have an RFID credit card and uh, normally when you swipe it or have it in your hand, you're pretty sure that you have it in your hand, but if you only put something in front of the reader, um, that can really be a card emulator <coughs> and somebody else you would need an accomplice or somebody uh, who is uh, in close proximity to the real card and then that gets forwarded and the real reader thinks it sees the real card but it does not. Which yep. is also uh, useful, for example, if you want to gain access to buildings and don't have any other attack available to break the encryption or the authentication of the card. So the relay attack works almost always. There are certain distance bounding protocols, but nobody uses them. And uh, most of them are kind of hard to implement because they are working based on the speed of light. So you get a pretty good guarantee by pure physics that the card must be within a range of about uh, 30 meters or th 300 meters of the reader. But in order to do that, you need to measure the signal, the travel time of the signal with nanosecond precision and that gets messy in the hardware. Nobody implements that because it's too expensive. Yeah. So here's an, here's an attack that really works against every RFID card that, uh, that is commercially available. And I don't think any manufacturer currently um, is even preparing a product that would prevent this. So everything else left aside, this is always possible. Um, other attacks, and we'll, we'll go through. Like, <laughs> Other attacks, and I'll, I'll, I'll now um, always give you the, the general idea of the attack, and Henrik will, will explain how this applies to, to MyFact Classic in particular, which is a nice target to play around with because it's vulnerable against so many different things. So emulation um, is based on the simple idea of, of pretending to, somebody, to be somebody else, sending somebody else's unique ID, which isn't possible from another RFID tag usually because the manufacturer go through great lengths, ensuring that every ID will ever only be manufactured once. But who's to say that you need to use an RFID tag to pretend to be another RFID tag? You can just use um, 
an, an emulation device, and we have a bunch of them fl floating around here. So little devices that are not even much bigger than, than the cards that they're emulating, and that you can easily hide in a, in a wallet. They can pretend to be an RFID tag, and in particular pretend to be somebody else's RFID tag. And how does that play out with my fare? Yeah, what we have here is an access control, a building access control system built by a great, a big German manufacturer and sold to many universities and many other facilities. They actually have, do have different uh, types of these access control systems and these devices have different security features but usually the university just buys the cheapest one, which was the case in this case. And this device doesn't even use the encryption that we later broke, but it uses only the unique identifier of the card. And as you've seen, I can easily spoof <coughs> that with one of my card emulators. And this video I recorded in January last year, where I didn't even have the full emulation working on the card emulator. It didn't work at all. It could only send, it could not receive. So I only sent out the UID basically at random and it just worked with this access control system. No challenge response, no nothing. Yeah, complete security disaster here, but it's only securing other keys. Um, another attack. So I, I said random numbers are really important and a fundamental step in every cryptographic protocol. That is because if two parties communicate, even encrypted, and there wasn't any randomness, they would always say the exact same thing to each other, encrypted, but nonetheless, you would prove that you are, that, that you are in the possession of a secret key simply by replaying what you overheard somebody else saying. So there must be random numbers. Now, on RFIDs, it's kind of hard um, to generate randomness. They're tiny computer chips, and how in a computer program do you get random numbers? In Linux, you would, you would um, collect polling events, you would, you would do timing, you would y use the fact that your computer is an incredibly complex system and the user um, operating it is even more complex, and so the multitude of inputs then gives you enough data to generate randomness based on. In RFID text, you don't have anything like that, and you don't have sophisticated RF measurement equipment either to maybe get randomness f from the airwaves. So this has been a long-standing problem, and um, at least when, when the MIFA Classic chip was designed, this hadn't been sufficiently solved yet. Yeah, and the MIFA Classic chip is really well documented. The random number generator that we found in there in our reverse engineering attempts you basically wouldn't even need to reverse engineer the MIFA Classic uh, card to find the MIFA Classic random number generator, which is uh, pictured down here. Um, and uh, there, there are two problems. Um, yeah, oh, there's only one problem. It's uh, not a real random number generator, it's a linear feedback shift register, so it's a pseudo random number generator, which is quite often the case, but it's also seeded from a fixed start value. They initialize it with one zero, one zero, one zero, and, and so on. And it's initialized when the card is powered up, so when you put the card into the field, it gets power, it powers up, issue, initiates the reset sequence, and then the re random number generator is reset to one zero, one zero, one zero, and then shifts with this uh, simple to determine sequence at one, uh, 106 kilohertz, that's the ISO bit clock. So it starts in a fixed state and uh, clocks with a fixed uh, shift register feedback at a fixed frequency and it's completely predictable in the MIFAC Classic cards. So, and uh, the random number is used when you start the authentication procedure. As we said before, you need the random number only in the authentication procedure. And if you control the timing between powering up the card and starting the authentication procedure, you completely control the random number that gets generated and can reliably regenerate the same random number each time. Yeah, and this is a very easy attack vector. If you have some proprietary RFID system, this is probably the first you should try out. And you might even find it accidentally. Do you want to tell them how we first yeah. read the, the my fair some 20 times and then how often yeah, did we I, get I, this I exact same sniffing, number? I was sniffing data and um, 
the sniffing setup was kind of convol convoluted because I used a logic analyzer which had uh, some Windows software. So I had a VMware running that had the Windows software for the logic analyzer, and then I had my Linux machine which ran the, anal uh, the, the decoding software that would analyze the logic analyzer output, and I needed to copy data from the VMware into my Linux machine to run the decoder. And to get samples, I simply used an open PCD and uh, had a power switch in the power line of the open PCD. And to get a new sample, I just switched the open PCD off and on. So it would start new, it would generate a new field, and the card would be initialized, and uh, the open PCD would authenticate to the card right away at almost always the same time. And then I captured that in my logic analyzer and analyzed that. And the first two attempts were the same. I got the same random number. I was kind of uh, confused because that is not supposed to happen. That's a random number. Maybe I copied the same file twice or did something wrong by copying from the VMware to the Linux machine. So I tried that again and got the same number again, but with a different uh, part after that. So there were, was a di different random number from the reader, but the same random number from the card. So obviously it was not the same file, but still the same random number from the card. And then I did like 23 trials of that in half an hour. And out of these 23, I got 12 times the same random number from the card and six times the same random number from the reader. So in total, I had six completely identical tra traces from 23 trials without doing anything special on the reader. I just had a reader that would authenticate right away after being switched on. And because it's a reader, it's in firmware, it doesn't have any timing uh, problems, it would generate the same timing most of the time yeah. by accident. Very much reminded us of, of this <laughs> random number generator, what we saw there. OK, moving on. Um, another um, set of attacks, and these are now the really interesting ones, the ones that, that break cryptographic assumptions. Um, and we'll only go over those that, that apply generally, that is not just to MyFair Classic. There's a bunch of things you can, you can do to just break the crypto one. It's kind of boring since it's already broken. And so these are things you can always do. The, the idea of a cryptographic break is to reverse a function that is supposed to be one way. So any encryption function, hash function, what have you in your cryptographic toolkit is a function that you, that you should be, with ease, be able to compute in one direction, given the secret key, but never in the other direction, at least not unless you have a secret key. Now, and we are breaking this assumption, and there's, there's many ways to, to, to break this. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll go over them generally, and then uh, Henrik adds what you can do to my fair classic. Um, the first and easiest and most obvious is to try all possible keys. One will fit. And in the, in the analogy of a normal key that you use to open your door, um, the, the key is th there are more keys as the, the shape of the key gets more complex. So imagine one of these American normal house keys. They usually only have five T's. And say these five T's could only either be high or low. So there's 32 possibilities of what the key could look like. And the easiest to get into the door is to have 32 different keys. Try them all. One will fit. Now, computers are a lot faster at trying keys. They can try a few billion keys a second, depending on the crypto algorithm. Um, but there are all the keys that they use also have a lot more Ts, or bits in this case. And the more bits you have, the, the harder it becomes to, to try out of possible keys. And so that is why the bit lengths should be at least a certain minimum. And in symmetric ciphers today, we're talking about 80 bits minimum um, for internet-grade security. Now, if a classic card uses, for instance, 48-bit keys, that's clearly below that threshold. But depending on the application, you could say anything um, up to 64 bits is, is weak and breakable in some way um, if the incentives and, or the stakes are high enough for somebody to attempt to break the key and has sufficient hardware resources. Yeah, the MyFair Classic has 48 bits, as we've already said, which is really weak. You can imagine a PDF encryption is, was usually 40 bits, and you would break that on your home PC in a weekend. 48 is not that much more. Um, the brute force key search um, 
on the protocol works only if you know the protocol. If you don't know the protocol, you need to uh, do a brute force attack on the card, which would take kind of longer because the card is kind of slow and only gets one attempt every six milliseconds, I think. So if you would try all possible keys against one card, you'd take 50,000 years, something like that. But if you know the, the algorithm, you can just implement the algorithm on your own computer, which can be as fast as you want, or you can implement it on FPGA, which can be even faster. And um, you can build an FPGA that cracks the key, or somebody has built an FPGA that cracks the key in 50 minutes for a couple of thousand dollars, I think. So um, that's, quite, that's quite fast already with specialized hardware. Yeah, if I may add to that, so one, um, one of the features of this card that we probably broke was the security through obscurity. If your only access to the system is through the defined API, through asking the card to please verify whether what you computed is correct, you indeed need 200,000 years to break a single key. Once you know the algorithm and can implement it on your own hardware, that, that number goes down to 50 minutes. So please do never rely on obscurity in, in your security design and do never assume that even though you, n you never told anybody your algorithm, nobody knows it. They can find it and we found this one, for instance, through reverse engineering the chip itself and clearly you have to give the chip to your customers. That's how you make money. Moving on, other um, cryptographic attacks that apply generally. There's, there's this whole field of time memory trade-offs and the idea here is to compute a code book. Now think of, a, of this one-way function as a secret language. So every, every word that you can come up with, every bit string, has a, an equivalent in the other language. And only you and whomever you communicate with speaks that language. So the encryption would be to translate it from your language into that secret language. Now one way to break it would be a dictionary. If somebody had the dictionary the reverse way, the secret language, into your language, that would be the decryption. Now, building such a dictionary um, is usually impossible because there's so many different words. Again, the number of bits in the key determines how large the dictionary is. And if there's 48 bits in the key, then there's 2 to the 48 possible bit strings or entries in your dictionary. But there's, there's points in between the two extremes of building the entire dictionary and trying every key one by one. So you can compute parts of the dictionary, or even the entire dictionary, but not store it, um, but store it co rather compressed. So the, the technique that is used is called rainbow tables. Um, and in those rainbow tables, you well, the, put the most simple way, you just write down the first and the last word of every dictionary page. But since the dictionary is structured in a certain way, if you find the first uh, or rather the last word of the page. You can, pr you can compute the entire page again very quickly and then find the word in the middle that you were looking for. And there are trade-offs. They, they are somewhere um, trading off more pre-computation time that always goes in as a, as a variable, um, but then in the actual attack trade-off time and space. So the more space resources, meaning hard disks, you throw at the problem, the quicker you can break keys. And 48-bit is is very doable um, for time memory trade-offs. In fact, almost easy. Um, they've been breaking 64-bit keys with, with ease now with, um, with time memory trade-offs. And the GSM cracking project that unfortunately came to an almost complete stop now, they have pre-computed um, exactly these compressed code books to break GSM communication, 64-bit keys. So for, um, for the MyFair Classic case, 48-bit key, um, do, do you have the numbers, r roughly? I think it was uh, like a couple of terabytes, which is really affordable <laughs> in space, will get you a full break on a normal PC, not FPGA, no special hardware, except the hard disks, in an hour or so. So for, for a few hundred dollars or euros in hardware resources, meaning hard disks, you get an attack platform that breaks you single keys in, in, in seconds, or definitely under a minute. Um, and this, oh, let me stress that, works in every 48-bit cipher. It didn't yet detect anything special about this cipher, any weakness. So the, 
the sheer fact that the, the key is too short allows for this and also allows for the brute force attacks. So whenever you find a crypto system that uses a key anything below 64 bits, you can do this attack. Um, more advanced attacks. And these are really fun. This is, this, this is almost cutting edge research. So the, this, this is a new idea almost. Um, I said your goal is to reverse a one way function. Now, you can do this by writing out a code book, you can do this by trying out every possibility and seeing which one matches, or you can simply try to do it mathematically. If a function can be computed in one direction, maybe there's a way to compute it the other, other way. And unless you're an, uh, a super genius mathematician, you probably want to rely on the knowledge of other mathematicians. And mathematicians have created what they call the set solvers, satisfiability solvers. Um, over many years now, and they've been really perfected to, do the, to reverse uh, functions or to, to solve problems that we know have a solution, we just don't know what the solution is. And the, 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 price, the most prize-winning ones, these are some of the trophies, um, is Miniset and Matej Sos from, from Inria. He was, uh, he was just ingenious in, in using Miniset and to porting it so that Miniset now can, can be used to break crypto problems. So all, all you do to reverse a cipher now is describe the cipher mathematically, in mathematical terms, in, in equations. That's fairly straightforward. The next slide will, will illustrate that. Um, <clears throat> and then give this one instance of the problem, meaning you, ha you know what went in and you, you know what came out, you just don't know the secret key. Give this instance of the problem to the satisfiability solver and it will find the one key that makes the equations work out. Right? Really, that's straightforward. And just to, to show you how straightforward this has been come, uh, become, let's, let's just for, for fun um, run, run one instance here of, of the, the MyFair cracker. Um. Yeah, so this is an application of the satisfiability <coughs> problem that you probably learned about in theoretical computer science if you're studying <coughs> computer science at the university and always wondered why am I doing this? Why am I being to told about a satisfiability problem? What's that good for? So this, this is, is what's good for. This is now going through a stage that we call guess and determine. What we do is we guess a few of the key bits, um, say six bits. So there's only, no, in this case I think it's yeah, six bits. So there's 64 um, possibilities of what these six bits could be, and only one is right. So we give it 63 guesses that are wrong, and it will tell us it's unsatisfiable. And one of the guesses will be correct, so the, the remaining key bits uh, will work out. And this is now running on my slow Mac on battery, but it shouldn't take more than like 40 or 45 seconds to, to reverse this entire cipher and give us all the remaining key bits. Yeah, this is uh, running on a sniffed uh, <coughs> test example with uh, a key, with a standard key of FF, 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 exactly. FF, and so on. So the last bytes that came out of here is the secret key. We just reversed from an overheard uh, sniff of MIFA communication. We broke the secret key by throwing this problem at, at a mathematical tool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what exactly did we do? Well, we described, <coughs> we described the function, and now I'm showing just the filter function, um, the, the binary table that, that maps the, the secret state into what we observe, the output bits. It's um, simple binary equations. Each of these can be um, seen as a lookup table, a 4 to 1 and then a 5 to 1 lookup table. So we write out these lookup tables, or rather the, the binary equations behind them, um, we take 50-some instances, meaning output bits. For each of those, we write out the, the, um, the filter function. And the, the one last step is then to, to compute from those, those 50-some different, 50 different secret states are a linear function of each other because it's a linear feedback shift register. Some of you might know what that is. And so we, we, come, we um, arrive at, at a few hundred equations, short equations, 
and those are enough given to the set solver to break this, this crypto problem. So this is no rocket science and could probably be done with pretty much any low complexity cipher. So now we're really attacking the, the nature of this piece. We're not attacking the key size anymore. We're not attacking the, the protocol, the bad random numbers. Here we are attacking um, statistical weaknesses things that cryptographers would probably have found if, if this had been analyzed by, by cryptographers um, before, and weaknesses that you'd want to avoid. For, um, for those of you that, that know a little bit more of cryptography, what we're really exploiting here is the lack of non-linearity, mostly, that complexity doesn't add up over many rounds, but that everything is connected through XOR, which is a linear function. Okay, moving on. Um, to sum up the MyFair weaknesses, this um, is not an example of a system where a little thing went wrong and now it's exploitable and needs a patch. This is an example of a system where pretty much every building block is fundamentally flawed. So this entire system consists of bro broken building blocks and the different attacks are enabled by either single uh, broken building blocks or the interaction of different ones. But this is an probably a great example to study and to try out attacks and a very warning example for anybody who attempts to do cryptography themselves. So here's a summary of things that you can do wrong if you try to do cryptography. Um, MyFair, however, is not um, a lone example and a one-time mistake in an industry that would otherwise come up with good products. Pretty much any RFID card that that claims to be secure, with the exception of very recent ones, um, uses proprietary and uses weak encryption. And this is really um, a summary of the entire market. Um, newer installations, the ones that are maybe two or three years old, they might already be using standard ciphers. AES, NXP calls that the Desfire card, for instance. Legic has some 13 megahertz cards that do AES. HID has some newer cards. <coughs> But pretty much any installation that you'll, you'll find out there um, so far that uses secure RFID is breakable and probably breakable with the very techniques I've, I've just um, listed. So there's a lot more work to do. And if you, if you are an active user of any of these systems, be aware of that. And if you're an active hacker with too much time, please help us attack some more of these. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's not really true that most uh, new installations are using secure systems because these usually are slightly more uh, expensive and if you show that to a bureaucrat who say, says, uh, but it says secure on both of them so we take the less expensive one, um, they'll usually use MyFair Classic or uh, the Legic old or the HID old system or they have a systems integrator who doesn't know squat about anything and uses the old cards and doesn't have the new cards. So ex for example, my university is building a new building and they are using the only two options they said would be UID, serial number based, or MyFair Classic cryptography. <laughs> Desfire was never an option. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, there are some proposed mitigations uh, for, for, for short-term efforts, for not for long-term replacements, but for short-term mitigation until you're ready to roll out the new system. Some, do, uh, some vendors are already offering this, uh, for example, under the name of a digital signature, or a digital signature, which isn't really necessary. What they basically do is check the UID, because those two systems fall into, uh, those systems fall into two classes, those that only check the UID and those that use the cryptography but don't care about the UID at all. So now they have a new idea, let's use the cryptography and the UID. And the way they do that is not by checking the UID in the backend system because that would be much more complicated, but they simply put the UID onto the card and digitally sign it with some key. Um, so that if you m modify the card contents or copy, simply copy the card onto your new card, which was an attack that was very viable uh, previously. For example, the Dutch demonstrated that on their university system and then the Dutch Minister of the Interior kind of noticed that they are using the same system and put up armed guards on all entrances. Um, 
so for these systems, it's uh, short-time mitigation te uh, technology to sign the UID or any other data that you are putting on the card and not rely on the MIFA Classic uh, access control mechanism. So you don't re rely on that, that it wouldn't be writable, but just assume that it's writable and then sign it and check the signature for all wallet state. And there's another technology that might be possible, maybe somewhat more complicated. Um, I think there was a talk on day one about it on our fingerprinting where you try to detect certain characteristics on the radio frequency spectrum and try to detect emulators. As we said, the UID can be spoofed if you're emulating the card and not copying simply the content onto a new card. So if you're doing RF fingerprinting, you might be able to detect that there is an emulator in place and then can decline the card. Or if they don't have an emulator, they most likely have a, the wrong UID, so you can detect that too. Yeah. So the idea here is to, to um, use external cryptography that the card doesn't really understand, but that where it only has to store the data to sign data and make sure that every state that is that a state that a card claims it has at the moment existed at some point in time. If you then also can tie it to the card itself, the only attack vector would be to use an emulator, in which case you want to do radio fingerprinting to perhaps detect everything other than, uh, than RFID cards. So these, these are both techniques that don't work 100% and that are probably circumventable, but from our experience of building emulators, it's really hard to get them exactly 100% right. And if you just implemented these, you're one step ahead of the hackers and you, you bought yourself a little extra time to replace MIFA with something else, but you don't get around doing that. You, you might just have some more time. Um, Knowing that people want to migrate away from MyFA Classic, um, we've been looking around for, for, for possible platforms to use to, um, to build, a, say, the next generation um, RFID system from. And we've been shocked to, to see that most systems tie an RFID reader IC to the cards. So every time your cards get compromised, you also throw away your reader infrastructure and basically start from scratch. We thought this was, this was an untakeable state, and so we, we went about implementing um, one of the first, perhaps the first, mostly software-driven RFID reader, where we implement MyFair Classic as a software module on this, this RFID reader by Texas Instruments, um, where, so since MyFair Classic is just a software um, component in here. If you want to replace your MyFair Classic card with something else, you just flash these devices and you could probably, if you, if you designed um, your reader based on these ICs, do this wirelessly or through the reader network. Um, so here, here's an idea that we hope will catch on in the industry to build RFID readers more software-based and to make them more flexible so you can quicker react to security breaches because as, as I've shown, MIFA Classic is not the only weak card, and even the cards that we today think are at least cryptographically strong, those will come up with their own problems, and they'll need to be replaced at some point. Another nice application of, of this, of this uh, reader, since everything is in software, you can change tiny bits, and you can make it behave slightly wrong, which I guess software people call fast testing. Hasn't been done much in RFID yet, but say you wanted to fuzz test your NFC phone, this would be the, the reader to do it with, to, to, to start changing things, maybe send an extra bit where it doesn't belong and see how the phone behaves. These, um, these implementation, these software stacks are full of bugs, I'm sure. Um, the, the software we're using on this it has, been, has been posted to, to my website um, yesterday, so feel free to download that, play around with it. It has a full MIFA Classic implementation in it, and we are um, selling these devices for um, 50 euros downstairs as, at the Furbu, um, where, where all the T-shirts hang. Um, and we will have a, a workshop tomorrow to, to help you all get started with this. So, Buy one, buy one today or tomorrow morning, come to a workshop. This will be quarter to one in a workshop area, and 
We'll show you what software we, you need, how to compile the source code, and how to, to maybe start building your own RFID fuzz tester. Yeah, so that's the first tool we're releasing. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, the second tool is the OpenPICC, which we have already talked about a lot in the uh, last years. And it was originally designed as an uh, RFID emulator that should be able to emulate any RFID card in the 13.456 megahertz range. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get it to work. The, as we said, the timing of uh, RFID emulators is kind of hard and until now, I've worked on it mostly the, the most part of the year, last year, and I didn't get it to work properly to, so that it works reliable. It works like 80% of the time, but that's not, not exactly good enough for most attacks. So um, that's not, not so nice. But what I did get working is to um, do a full duplex RFID sniffing on that. Be, that's kind of a side effect, an unwanted side effect, because normally when you build an RFID emulator, you only want to receive the RFID reader signal. <laughs> and what we found is that if you put a card, another RFID card, like really close to that, uh, like so, I have a double-sided sticky tape on here uh, below that, so I hope it sticks. Um, really close to that, you'll also receive the car signal that the other card sends. And um, then I implemented firmware that simply receives the signal and sends it to USB, which sounds simpler than it is, and is received by a host application on the PC, and I s basically get um, um, a radio receiver for 13.56 megahertz that can uh, do amplitude demodulation and sample the demodulated signal at 3.3 mega samples per second, binary, binary signal. And if you set the threshold value just right and um, choose the distance between the card and sniffer and the reader just right, it's slightly complicated now. Uh, still, I'm going to make that easier. If you choose the distance just, just right, you receive the signal both of the reader device and of the card and you have a full duplex sniffer for not a lot of money. I, unfortunately, we don't have much of these left. I think we have about two of these left, which we need for our own purposes, but we're going to build new ones, and they will be released in January about, probably. And if you already have one, here's the, the URL to, to download the, the most recent firmware. Yeah, that's, that's not yet in there, the <laughs> sniffing for both directions. That's only the code for sniffing in one direction, but I'll add the code for sniffing both directions shortly. And what you will get is, uh, as I said, amplitude demodulation um, transmission of the signal to the host. On the host, there's an application running that's decoding and demangling the samples, and you get an output that basically has all zeros and ones for all the samples, and you get an output that has all the changes in the signal, and then you get a, an application that uses these uh, deltas times to decode the protocols and probably ana decode ISO 14403A, so you get a full duplex ISO 14403A dump that you then can use with the other tool, the algebraic uh, quack tool, to break MIFA encryption, for example. I already did that yesterday for somebody. So if you have a card and a reader, that's the problem. If you have a card and a reader with you, you can just find me, and I will uh, break your key for you. <coughs> My yeah. deck phone is 5015. For, 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 for those that didn't get that now, um, if, if you are the legitimate owner of, of a MIFA card that you lost the key to, this is the device that gets you the data out of your card again. <laughs> <coughs> So th there was the open pick that, that has been sold out in the, in the web shop a long time ago, and that is now being, being reproduced. But Milos and Britta Meriap, they, the, the, the sleepless um, ingenious hardware designers, they have come up with the open pick 2, which 
just blows me away. But let, let Henrik tell you about it. Yeah, the Open PSDC2 is a dual uh, multi-purpose device. It's kind of like a multi-application card, if you know that term from smart card uh, renders. What you get on there? You have um, a processor, an uh, RTI91 uh, processor with 48 megahertz uh, frequency. You get uh, 16 by megabytes of SD RAM. You get an SD card slot in the back. Uh, let me show that here. That's the processor, that's the SD RAM, a micro SD card slot. Um, then you have um, a new, the new processor is much easier to flash than the previous one. If you know how to flash an OpenPSCC 1, the OpenPSCC 2 is so much easier. You just press this button and uh, send the new firmware. You get the two LEDs that you know and love. Um, you get a third LED that is connected to the battery charge controller, so you get a full lithium-ion battery. I haven't tested yet how long it will last, but I accidentally let, left my device on for like three hours and it wasn't discharged after three hours, so I guess it will last three hours, depending on what you do with it. Um, what you get on there also is a three-dimensional accelerometer. So, for example, you could, uh, let's say, booby trap the device so it would lead itself if it's tempered with or something, if you want to. Um, and the RFID, uh, you also get a real-time clock that is, I think, about here, which is always connected to the battery and not switched on or off, so you have also a clock on there. You will get an open beacon interface. Yeah, That's you, Sputnik, the things that people carry around, they can talk yeah. to that too. It's the same 2.4 GHz transmission interface. So if you have two of these devices, you could uh, let them talk to each other, and which I hadn't pre mentioned now just yet, um, the RFID part on this is handled by the NXP chip, the NXP PN532, which is an NFC chip, which is included in most well, in some phones and hopefully much more in the future. So it does NFC, which also means it does a reader side, complete reader side, and it does a complete card side emulation in this one IC. So it doesn't has, have the full analog front end that Milos designed for the OpenPSCC one, which enabled us to sniff the communication. Unfortunately, it's not in there. The filters in this device are much better, unfortunately, so it won't be a sniffer, probably. Sorry about that. But it should be a full emulator because we don't have to worry about the analog side anymore. We just get a proper signal. What we did, what this NFC chip does offer is the connection of a so-called secure element, which is just a wired NFC, a NXP card, a Smart MX, for example. Uh, so you normally just hardwire uh, an RFID card to that, and instead of that, we just connected these wires to the processor, so we should be able to emulate a card on the processor. Yeah, so here, here's, an, here's a card that can talk to pretty much anything RFID, both the readers and the cards and the Sputniks, that has enough power under the hood to do simple and, crypto. Uh, we are not done yet. Oh, there's more, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> yeah, because it does have this 2.4 gigahertz interface, if you have two of these, you should be able to uh, execute the proxying or relay attack with that because you can set one for card emulation and one for reader side emulation and have a 2.4 gigahertz radio link. And you have this battery with charge controller. And also there's, well, this, this thing is, is, is two things in one. It's a micro SD slot and it's also an ID000 uh, smart card inter, uh, interface so you can put a in a real wired smart card and store your secrets in there so that somebody who finds that doesn't get your secrets. And um, yeah. Yeah, so we, we do crypto on board here if we want to at least low complexity ciphers. We were talking about rainbow tables. I don't know what size they make SD cards in these days, but th yeah. there, should be, there should be plenty of storage for at least like the, what, the, the Dutch group There's released a the tool, Crypto the One. That should run on this device, I think, to, to onboard break um, MyFair Classic encryption. It's portable, too, with a battery. It's just ingenious. There's one more thing. Do you want to add something? <laughs> yeah, and one more thing. <laughs> it's an e-book reader, too. Can no I have kidding. a camera on here? 
camera. <laughs> uh, 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 um, it's an e-book reader, yeah. <laughs> this goes to Britain and Milos Meria. <laughs> this will be available in numbers in February, I hear. So keep keep tuned. Yeah, we are, I think Milos, if you want to talk to Milos, I think he's looking for open source developers because all the firmware that is currently running on this device is open source at our SourceForge repository. And I think he will be looking for open source developers also for the e-book branch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely a device to, to be looking forward to. Um, to, to quickly sum up, um, if, if, you, if you are building RFID systems, please make sure you use documented standard ciphers that a lot of cryptanalysis has, has gone into. Um, and implement as much as possible, if not everything, in software so that if the, the nasty hacker comes up with the next exploit, you can quickly react and you can quickly upgrade your, your infrastructure. If you are more like us and you like to play around with things, start doing that, get our tools, get the TI board, um, join our workshop tomorrow, um, wait impatiently for the open pick to be available as a sniffer, the open pick 2 as a full-blown emulator, ebook, what what have you, um, and help us develop the software for all these devices. There's a lot of developing effort going in um, by, by Henrik, Milos uh, as well, and we need more people to, to get things moving quicker. There's so many RFID systems we'd like to be um, looking at. To end at a more positive note, we haven't given up hope in, the, in this technology yet, and we think it, it has huge potential to be a, a great breakthrough, more security technology if a few things are done right. Um, as said over and over again, use public crypto, don't try to build your own, but also don't be paranoid about um, attackers. Be, be more aware of what the risks are and how much damage can really be caused. Oftentimes, um, hope is given up at the, at the mere side of, of um, some possibility of an attack where huge attack vectors are, are completely ignored. So we need some more balance, some, some more what we would call threat modeling, um, a more holistic view of how vulnerable is your RFID system and what risk are you willing to take. And then from, from my consulting work, I've, I've come across over and over again of, of the one number one enemy of RFID system, and that is vandalists. Um, most of these systems are, are today pressed onto people. You don't get a choice whether you have an RFID in your passport, in your train ticket, and so forth anymore. This is, this is your number one enemy, people that break your system simply because you force them to use the technology. So by only giving them an opt-out opportunity, by giving them a chance not to use the technology, your s system is already a lot more secure. There's a lot less incentive to break it. So if you are operating an RFID system planning on, if you're consulting with anybody who is planning to press, please press for an opt-out so that this technology isn't <coughs> mandatory for everyone. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Okay, so now we would be open to questions. I think we have about six minutes left for our sign time and then maybe some more. Yeah, and I kindly <laughs> ask you to stay here for a few minutes until we're done. So if you've got to leave, leave quietly uh, so that there's not a huge disruption. Anyways, questions? That's weird. Did we lose everybody, or were we perfectly clear about every single point? <laughs> no questions? Okay, well, thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>